Good morning, everyone, or wherever it is you're, you're in your place in the world. Um, here in Bakersfield, it is 915, so we're on the West Coast. And if you're joining us from a different area, let us know while we're waiting for more people to be admitted here. But we welcome everyone. Hopefully your weather is as nice as ours. We've got <clears throat> pretty nice weather. Well, it's supposed to be in the 80s today, which, you know, for April is not fun, but I've seen that it's actually snowing in a few places. So, you know, I suppose it's better than that. Anyway, um, I'm gonna get started here in just about a minute. And then we'll be able to bring our guest speaker on in time for him to speak. He's gonna be speaking, um, yeah, compared to July here, Bill says this is great weather. I agree, Bill. I don't like July in Bakersfield. You know, 110 is not, I'm not fond of that, let's just say that. Uh, 70s, 70s all the time. And Marty, she's calling, what's your weather like in, uh, okay. It snowed yesterday in Colorado Springs and it was cold this morning. I was gonna say, cause I'm sure your weather is not, yeah. So I guess, you know, our weather isn't so bad. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Since this is being recorded, um, if people sign in late, then they can go and catch up. So, cause we wanna keep on time. So good morning. Um, Marty said spring is really struggling here. Yeah, well, we've got summer right on our heels. So. <laughs> anyway, good morning. I am Joan Raymond, president of Writers of Kern. I've got two amazing people helping me this morning. Don A, we have Don A, our vice president, and Sandy, our membership chair. So everyone is going to be helping during the meeting, uh, fielding questions and, and recording and, um, letting people in the meeting. So um, what I'd like to do is if you're brand new, we, we used to do this when it was in person and it was so much easier because you know people could raise their hand or something. But if you've never been to one of our meetings before, um, give us, say something in the chat or raise your hand or say something, you know, it's, we always love it when new people join us and it's, it's exciting. I know that, um, so I saw uh, Team City Adventures, I saw your hand raised. So if you wanna just let us know where you're calling in from or calling in, <laughs> zooming in from, that's great. If not, that's okay too, but it's just um, always fun to see new people. Yeah, we're, we're in London. Oh, in London, okay, yeah. that's cool. So what time is it there? It must be, wait a minute, five o'clock, 5.15? Uh, yeah, 20 past five. <laughs> yep, I know you guys are eight hours ahead, that's cool. <laughs> All right, go ahead and mute yourself again. Okay. Thank you, that's awesome. Um, anyway, so we like to recognize our guests. Hi, Annis, we like to recognize our guests and um, visitors if, <laughs> these are all our members waving to each other since we only see each other now like once a month during these. And then also another thing we do, since we're a writing club, it's really important for us to do a couple of things. One recognize people that have submitted something in the last 30 days. So if you've submitted anything at all, raise your hand. Um, let's see, Christine said, from New York, first time visitor. Welcome, Christine. That, oh, North Carolina, sorry, I, my eyes, senior moment. But yeah, NC, that's North Carolina. <laughs> Welcome. Um, if you submitted something, Put it in the chat, you know, just say, hey, I submitted a poem, I submitted a short story or something like that. And then, you know, we'll all give you a shout out. Um, Diane said she submitted to, um, oh, Walk um, National Poetry Month. Awesome, Diane. And, and because that's important for us, important that, you know, as writers, we get our stuff out there. And if you've had a rejection, that's important too. Let us know in the, um, you know, in the comments that you had a rejection and you can just say me and we applaud you. This is the one place that you remember if you get a rejection during the month, you can come to walk and we will applaud you for your rejection because it means you're actually putting your work out there and it's not easy to get rejected, but um, 
Sandy said, no response from Chicken Soup is a rejection. Um, Diane, rejection from Autumn Sky Poetry side. Let's clap for them. Yay. That's awesome because, you know, even though it's hard, that means you're closer to that yes. And we also want to talk about successes. Has anyone had a success in the last 30 days? I know that we've had a lot of members that have gotten um, published in the National Poetry Month on our blog. So if you have been published or had a book come out or anything like that in the last 30 days, I'll start. I had my first cozy mystery come out um, last week. <laughs> Anybody else? Let's see. Annis, your poem is up today on the walk blog. Awesome. Um, let's see. Gary said he got ex he submitted and got ex accepted. Congratulations, Gary. That's awesome. Um, so for the walk blog, if you go to risethecurrent.com forward slash, I think it's blog. <laughs> it's pretty easy. You can see. Um, you can see the poems that have been submitted for National Poetry Month. We have taken them from members and non-members and every day our amazing webmaster adds another one to the list. So you can go back and read them all or you know catch up when you can. But anyway, we, we were very fortunate to have more than enough submissions and there'll be a blog post every month. I mean, every day this month, so. Let's see, anything else anybody want to say? I'm just waiting. If not, I'm gonna turn it over to Don A and she's gonna talk about announcements. Okay, so our announcements. Um, we have some board openings. Our main one right now, we are looking for a webmaster. Um, members or non-members with webmaster slash WordPress experience are encouraged to email webmaster at writersofkern.com for more information. So if you printed out your uh, meeting agenda, that email address will be on there. Um, but again, I'll repeat, it's webmaster at writersofkern.com. Um, and that's for more information about that board opening, um, or if you are very much interested in uh, taking that position, um, we really need you. So next we have Open Mic Mondays. Um, this is a perk of being a member of Writers of Kern. So it's the first Monday of each month and it's members only. It's a member only event. So I would suggest that you uh, attend, uh, listen to other members, read their poetry or their works. Um, and like I said, it's a really big perk of being a member of Writers of Kern. Um, another perk of being a member of Writers of Kern is our book club. And it is the second Thursday, which is odd months. Um, and it's a member only event. Um, and um, in the upcoming all, um, events, it'll let you know when the next book club is. Um, and then we have our Dan McGuire blog challenge. And that ends May 9th. And even though it ends May 9th, um, you can still hop on in and um, write in your blog and put that on our um, and on, on Facebook in our group, uh, our Writers of Kern um, group page. Um, and it's 13 weeks, 26 posts. Um, I know it's kind of, it kind of seems crazy to write 26 posts from now until May 9th, but this will give you experience writing your blog or getting your blog started. Um, and you never know, you may be able to write that 26 post um, by May 9th, but it ends May 9th um, and everyone can participate. Um, and so if you really want to join, email events at writersofcurrent.com um, and uh, we will make sure that you get all the information that you need. So if there are any questions to anything that I've said, or if you have questions about anything that hasn't been said, you can email us at info at writersofkern.com um, and uh, make sure that you email info at writersofkern.com. That's how you're gonna get a response. Anywhere else, there's a chance that you won't get responded to. So make sure that you send us to info at writersofkern.com and then it will be channeled to the right person. Okay, so I'm going to give it back to Joan so she can let you know all of our upcoming events. 
Thanks, Donnie. And the one thing about the blog challenge, a lot of people say, I write my blog and nobody ever reads it. Well, guess what? You will have a built-in audience for the next month because if you know you you enter and you know, and the reason we say it's a contest because if for those that actually make the 26 posts in 13 weeks, um, in May, we have something called walk honors. And this is something that we have done for years and years and years. And we honor all the people that have um, published traditionally. We want, honor all the blog challenge survivors. You actually get a certificate and I survived the blog challenge. Um, and we do a lot of other um, recognition and it'll be normally it was, well, Back when it was a big dinner, now it's 15 minutes before the meeting. So we will still honor everyone. And, but you do, you'll have a built-in audience. You know, you can post your blog and it will go out in our newsletter and people will read it. So it is a chance, even if you only participate for four weeks. I'm not gonna read all the upcoming because everyone got an agenda. So you can see when the next Open Mic Monday and our book club, um, I do want to call attention to May 15th, which is our Walk Honors, and then Evan Gao, who's a creator of Story Origin app, he's going to be speaking. June 19th, our board election, so members, we need you there. Uh, we're going to be electing just about an, a 95% new board, so we will need our members there to just raise a hand and, um, and vote, and we're going to be... Um, publishing that slate of new officers in the May newsletter. So you'll know who's gonna be running. And then our guest speaker is Brendan Constantine who spoke years ago at a conference. He's amazing. He's gonna be talking about the art of getting it wrong, which um, I know for some of us putting those first boards on the page, we're a little nervous about getting it wrong. So he's gonna be talking about that. And then in July, I already know who the speaker is, but I, didn't put anything down because we don't have a um, speaker um, a topic yet. So you'll find out about that soon. So I am going to, you know, if anybody has any questions, um, type them in the chat. And if there's none, then I am going to introduce our guest speaker. Okay, I, I unmuted you, Dean, did you? So can you, can we hear you okay? Hello everyone, can okay, you hear me? Great. Okay, so um, I'm thrilled today to introduce our guest speaker, Dean James, who um, writes, if you can see it, Cozy Mysteries under the name Miranda James. This is his 13th book. And I have to say, I'm a fan, I've read them all. Um, book number 14, is going to be released August 31st, What the Cat Dragged In. And um, all of us that are fans are anxiously waiting to see what's gonna happen with um, Charlie and Diesel. <laughs> anyway, um, best, I wanna introduce Dean James, best-selling cozy mystery author. Welcome, Dean. Thank you, Jen. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, this is, of course, a brave new world with, uh, with Zoom and everything, but uh, it does give us a chance to get together with people from all over the place. So um, I thought I'd give you just a little bit about my background, uh, you know, and who is he to be talking about, to us about mysteries and so forth. I've uh, been a mystery reader since about the age of 10 when I first discovered Nancy Drew. How many of you ever read Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and all those kids' books? Yes, yes. Well, that was my entry to, to mysteries, and uh, I just kept going from there. And Nancy Drew is still one of my favorite characters of all time. Uh, she was fearless. And uh, for a little boy growing up on a farm in North Central Mississippi with no brothers and sisters, you know, Nancy was a lot of fun. I had lots of cousins, but I didn't have any siblings. Um, I uh, went to school and got uh, several degrees in history. I meant to become a history professor teaching medieval history, but that was 35 years ago and the job market was extremely meager. So I ended up working in libraries and eventually got my degree in library science. And I've pretty much been a librarian since then. I'm a medical librarian, which is fun because I have access to all kinds of databases to look up poisons and other things. 
because I like either poisoning people or pushing them down the stairs or hitting them over the head. Uh, I don't really want, if my dad were still alive, I, I would probably use guns because he, he knew things about guns, but you know, it's just more fun to, to poison people. Um, and so I have access to all that kind of stuff. I also spent 30 years working at an independent bookstore in Houston, Texas. That's where I went to graduate school. Yeah, uh, the store is called Murder by the Book, and it's one of the oldest and certainly the largest mystery bookstores in the country. And I spent nine years there full time as the general manager, and I worked there 21 years as you know part time. So uh, I got to read lots of mysteries. I got to meet lots of mystery writers, and I went to uh, numerous um, you know mystery conventions over the years. So I got to know a lot of different writers. And if you'll excuse me a minute, Pippa. I also have four cats <laughs> and the, the queen herself, Pippa, the calico, um, she's the only female among the four and she gets a little testy, shall we say, with the, the three boys. Anyway, she was about to have an argument, but um, anyway, so I'm one of those people, uh, I'm a writer, but I also know the business end of the business of book selling and, and selling mystery. So I've been involved in that since 1984. So I, one of the things I try to offer is a perspective from both sides, uh, both the writing and, uh, you know, how a bookstore, an independent bookstore is going to look at, you know, what you've got. So, so that's sort of my basic background. Uh, I wrote my first book when I was about 12, uh, heavily influenced by Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden. I don't know if any of you remember Trixie Belden. But she grew up on a, a farm in, in, in New York, and I grew up on a farm in Mississippi, so I, I, I could identify with Trixie. And uh, I uh, wrote it out, and my aunt typed it up, and of course, it was actually more like a novella than a novel. But I sent it to the publisher, Trixie Belden, and got it back very quickly with a badly mimeographed rejection notice. You know, And that kind of you know, put an end to my writing career at the age of 12 because I discovered I was much better at coming up with titles for the books than actually writing the books themselves. I had, you know, come up with like 40 titles of this series I was going to write, you know, the clue of this and the secret of that and the mystery of whatever, you know. Uh, so I put that, I put that aside. I did not handle rejection well at that age. And it wasn't until I was in graduate school in Houston that I decided to start, to start writing again. And I had had begun working at the mystery bookstore and I was reading more mysteries because I had easy access to them. And I loved academic mysteries. And I tell people that, you know, being in graduate school was not necessarily a corollary to wanting to kill people, but, you know, there you are. So um, I set a mystery in the history department at Rice University, which is where I was studying. And uh, it was an amateur detective story, which is my favorite. Uh, I like seeing ordinary people involved in these things because I have no interest in studying police procedure. I love reading police procedurals, but that's not what I want to write uh, most of the time. So anyway, I wrote that book uh, called it Death by Dissertation, and it went through a number of permutations. Uh, I, I finished it in 1985, and that was when I first submitted it to an editor and came back with some encouraging words, but ultimately, no thank you. Uh, it was published 30 years later. You know, so, you know, you don't, ne don't necessarily always have to give up on that first manuscript. Sometimes you can salvage it, but uh, uh, it went, as I said, it went through several incarnations uh, with, plus with a change of point of view uh, and everything. Uh, but uh, my first publications were in nonfiction. Uh, by that time, I was a library, working in the library, and a good friend of mine, also a librarian, a woman named Jean Swanson, also very much an enthusiast, uh, and I were both big fans of women mystery writers. And in the late 80s and early 90s, there was kind of a renaissance in publishing uh, mysteries. Publishers began to discover that, gosh, you know what? Books by women can actually sell. You know, it's not all Mickey Spillane and Robert B. Parker and you know, Tom Clancy and whoever was coming along at those times. So, uh, but the critical literature, you know, the, what just wasn't there, you know, they weren't uh, getting reviewed the same way men were, and that's still, still an issue, frankly. 
So Gina and I decided to write um, a guide to mysteries by women. And we focused on contemporary women. Uh, we didn't cover Agatha Christie and people like that. We focused on the current uh, mystery writers and we had enough for uh, to, to over 200 writers in, in the book. It was called By a Woman's Hand and it was published in 1994 by Berkeley. And we did a second edition two years later, adding more writers. And then G and I subsequently did two other reference books, uh, one on mysteries by men and women called Killer Books. And we also did a companion to Dick Francis, uh, his, all of his books. And later on, I, with another friend, I wrote a book on Robert Parker. But that was my introduction to publishing. Um, I didn't sell a novel until around 2000, and that's when a small press in Tennessee, uh, they wanted to publish Southern mysteries because that, that was what they focused on was on Southern literature and things. So um, I submitted uh, not that first book I had written, but the sequel I wrote to it later. And they accepted that and it got thoroughly edited by a woman who I think is the best editor I have ever encountered. I mean, she was wonderful. And so they published three of my books, including Death by Dissertation. But in the meantime, I had also uh, come up with other ideas to write. And I'd sold a series to Kensington about a gay vampire who resides in a little village in England. He's American, but he's very much an Anglophile. And uh, I published four books with, in that series, Posted to Death, fake to death, decorated to death, and baked to death. And they're available as eBooks now. They're out of print, but they're available as eBooks. And I let my, my as I say, my sort of bitchy side, uh, you know, come out in that because uh, they're in the first person and the vampire is, has kind of a snarky sense of humor. So, so and, I, and I really had fun playing with that. It's sort of like Agatha Christie meets the lighter side of Anne Rice. You know, there's no horror, it's all for fun and laughs. And um, then I sold a series to Berkeley about a young, a, a woman who lives in a trailer park in uh, North Central Mississippi, uh, who has uh, three kids, uh, one of whom is a single mother with, you know, no sign of the father around. And, uh, and she works um, in a, a little, uh, little restaurant, diner type, uh, thing to uh, make ends meet. And she works overnight at a place called Budget Mart, stocking shelves. And if you think hard enough, I'm sure you can figure out what Budget Mart really is. Um, and I had a lot of fun with that. The character was loosely based on my late mother. And uh, those characters are very dear to my heart. I wrote five of those and they were published under the name Jimmy Ruth Evans. Because by that point, we had realized that publishing things under Dean James uh, made it easy for them to get lost in the internet world. So if you turn my name around, as it has often been done throughout my life to James Dean, you Google me, you find lots of stuff about dead movie star. And it's kind of hard to find me in there because he's much more popular than I am. Um, and so that's when I started using pseudonyms for my fiction. Uh, I also wrote a couple of books about a trio of bridge playing detectives uh, as Honor Hartman and they didn't last, but it wasn't until I started writing the Cat in the Sack series that I finally found, uh, you know, the thing that uh, they caught on. And by that was, you know, 25 years, the first one was published in, in 2010, and that was 25 years after I submitted my first book, uh, adult book. And so I became an overnight sensation after 25 years. Um, and the, in this series, the main character is a widower who has moved back to uh, his hometown in Mississippi. It's called Athena, Mississippi, and it's very loosely based on Oxford, which is home to the University of Mississippi or Old Miss. And he's retired. He retired from his library job in Houston, Texas, and he's also an inherited a house from his uh, late great aunt. So he doesn't really have to work. Um, you know, she left him a lot of money, but he works part-time at the college as the cataloging and rare books librarian. And, and that's, that's my background in uh, libraries is what we call technical services or, or cataloging. And uh, so I gave him that and he also volunteers at the public library. So that way the publisher wanted the library angle and they also wanted the cat. 
And the, the cat is a Maine Coon named Diesel. He weighs about 35 pounds. And he's actually was based on a real cat that, that, that belonged to the late Barbara Mertz, who you may know as either Barbara Michaels or Elizabeth Peters. Uh, she had the very first Maine Coon I ever met who was known as the Diesel and he weighed 40 pounds. And he was not overweight, he was just a big cat. First time I saw him, I thought a bobcat had gotten into the house. But, but he was big and sweet and you know, very loving. And when I knew I was gonna write the series, I thought, well, why not a Maine Coon? And I do not have a Maine Coon, not all four of mine are rescues and they're none of them are Maine Coons, but they, they talk sometimes like Maine Coons do. Um, and two of them are in here looking out the window, they probably see a lizard, so. So anyway, that, that's, that I, you know, series got started in 2010. The first one's called Murder Past Due. And to my shock and surprise, uh, it made the extended New York Times bestseller list for mass market paperbacks, which, you know, was, was a shock. I mean, that's one of those things that we always, you know, hope will happen. And when it does, it was totally surreal. And several books after that continued to make the list. And then they sort of published them in hardback, which kind of killed that because, um, you know, you know it, that list is very competitive. But anyway, it, the series got off to a good start. And, you know, with that first book, with it hitting like that, I'm thinking, okay, is this a one hit wonder? You know, they're gonna read one book and then they'll think, oh, okay, that's enough of that. But, you know, people have really adopted the characters and, the senior says, series has continued as, as Joan said, book 13 came out uh, last year, book 14 is about to come out and there are, I'm working on 15 and there are two more under contract after that. I also wrote four books in a spinoff series. Thank you, Joan. Um, about there are two older sisters who are sort of the grand dames of this little town, Miss Angel and Miss du, uh, Dixie Ducote, who are based on real sisters that I know who are much younger, uh, and both have children, but uh, these are two spinster sisters, but the attitudes and the relationship between the two are very much like that of the real sisters, and they are a hoot in real life, and they're fun to write, and uh, I wrote, was able to write four books about them, uh, but they just weren't selling as well, so I'm, so I'm writing the, mainly the Cat and the Sax books, and um, the, the sisters continue to appear because they're very popular, and I, I love them too. And that leads me into talking about writing a series. What I write are called cozy mysteries. And I don't know if some of you are probably very familiar with that term, others it may be something new to you. But think of Murder, She Wrote, okay? Uh, where the body count is incredibly high and nobody in their right mind will let Jessica Fletcher come in their house because somebody's gonna die, right? <laughs> Cabot Cove is probably empty by now. But um, that's the kind of book, you know, there's not a lot of blood and gore. You don't watch autopsies. I mean, NCIS and Law and Order, I mean, they're great shows, but I really don't want to look at an autopsy when I'm reading a book, you know. And that's, that's the appeal for these books, uh, of these books for a lot of readers. It is cozy. It's, you know, safe involvement in a crime in an investigation. You know, you can kind of put yourself in the main character's, you know, uh, shoes, kind of like we used to do with Nancy doing the Hardy Boys or Sherlock Holmes or, you know, Miss Marvel. You can kind of go along for the ride, but you're not going to get hurt. Although Nancy did get hit over the head a lot. You know, it's a wonder the child didn't have some kind of long-term, you know, concussion effects now that I think of it. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a safe entry into that world for the reader. And, uh, and there are a lot of cozy lovers out there. Uh, there are numerous cozy groups on Facebook, for example. Um, and they will let you know very quick. I mean, there's certain things that they do, want, do not want to read. They don't want explicit violence. They don't want autopsy scenes. They don't mind a little bit of gore, but it has to be kind of restrained. They don't want any explicit sex. You know, there can be some romance. In fact, I have a, a very slow burning romance in my series and people are very impatient for Charlie to get married again. <laughs> I keep getting asked, why when is he gonna get married? But, um, you know, those elements are fine. 
but you do not want to rub people's face into violence in your work. And this is a key thing. If this doesn't appeal to you as a reader, then you don't need to be writing it. You need to write what interests you, what draws your passion. I love these books, you know, because that they're my first love in the mystery genre. I read more widely than that, but these are the ones that I really love reading. And you, I think you invest that part of yourself in what you write when you write books like this. And it, but when you write anything, I mean, if you really love spy thrillers, then your passion is going to come through in your if you're writing one. You know, you really have to put that aspect of yourself into whatever you write, whether it's a Western or a romance or, you know, what have you. And I think readers uh, are smart enough to pick up on lack of sincerity. If you're thinking, oh, these mysteries sell by the bucket load, then I can write one. They can't be that hard. I'll do this. Well, I'll, you know, readers are going to pick up on that. You know, when they think the writer stops caring, then they will go off the series. They're, they're pretty sharp about this stuff. You know, so you have to keep up the passion. Write what really grabs you and interests you. In this case, I think what really so people on this series are my characters. For one thing, I write about a man. And most cozy mysteries, the main characters are women. Uh, and I, the series was intended to be about a woman and a cat, but that didn't pan out the way I thought it would, even though I'd written about women characters before in other series. So I switched to Charlie, and that really seemed to be the key. My editor loved the change. And so we went forward with Charlie. As I said, he's a widower. And in the first book, um, he's living in his aunt's house uh, in Athena. It's a big house. And she used to let rooms to the students at the college. And he has continued that at least early on in the series. And uh, there's a mystery connected to one of uh, his one boarder. Uh, Charlie has two children who are grown. Uh, Sean, his son, uh, is a corporate lawyer in Houston, and his daughter, Laura, is out in Hollywood trying to make her way um, as an actress. Well, as the series progresses, I bring, you know, Sean home, Sean to Mississippi in the second book because he's burnt out as a corporate lawyer and other things happened. And then Laura comes in the third book. And from that point on, they're part of the series and they live full time in Athena. And there are other characters. There's this housekeeper that he inherited from his aunt, Azalea, who is one of those tough uh, African-American women that you do not argue with. You know, she's the lady who runs everything at the church and nobody crosses her. She and uh, Charlie's aunt were great friends and uh, they ran the boarding house together and everything. But her daughter is the uh, chief deputy in Athena, who is a very modern woman, educated. She's tough as nails. She can't stand the fact that her mother is, is working as a domestic. She thinks her mother should be retired. And there's, you know, some butting of heads, you know. And that's the other thing. You, you kind of need to have a conflict in these books. Everything can't be nice and cozy and sweet. And Charlie and Kanisha, the daughter, butt heads a lot. Although eventually down the road, they begin to find a way to work together because Kanisha appreciates the fact that there are things that Charlie can find out that she can't just because of, you know, different backgrounds and different you know, settings and things. So that's kind of the setup. Uh, and, you know, these are continuing characters. There are a few other minor characters that we see. And then every book, there are new characters uh, introduced who have something to do with the plot. Uh, and most of the books have some connection one way or the other with, with, with either the public library or the academic library uh, writing uh, that comes up uh, in one or two of the books. In the second book, for example, Charlie's hired to catalog um, a rare book collection uh, belonging to an eccentric wealthy man in the town. And that was fun because I could put every rare book that I really wanted to own into this collection, like a first edition of Pride and Prejudice and uh, a copy of Edgar Allan Poe's Hammer Lane, which is one of the rarest things in existence, you know, and other things too. Uh, that was a lot of fun. But, um, you know, I, I put in the library background in there and 
Uh, I try not to let it overwhelm, but I librarians love it because, you know, as a librarian who writes these books, I know what librarians lives are like, and they really get a kick out of that. And in most of these cozy series, there's always some kind of background uh, that's a hook. I mean, it's almost become a cliche, but there are, you know, there are the cozy mysteries that have, you know, uh, cupcake shops and bakeries and catering services and all those things. And there are lots of cozies where the uh, main character has a pet. Uh, there's even cozies about, you know, pet boutiques and, and things like that. There's, you know, all kinds of needlework and sewing and, and those kinds of things. That gives the publisher a bit of a marketing hook. And these books, you know, kind of get dismissed, but um, sometimes just because there is this marketing hook. But if you know a lot of, there are a lot of quilters out there. And if you are somebody who knows a lot about quilting and you write a book with a character who quilts, then you've got, an, you've got a market there. Because they love to read about people like themselves who do these things, but who, in addition to quilting, you know, may stumble across a dead body now and again. You know? So it helps to have your character have some interest. So they're just not a busybody sitting there waiting for something to happen and then they pounce on it. You know, they're involved in the community in some way. One of my all-time favorite series of cozies was written by Erlene Fowler, whose character Benny Harper works in a uh, crafts museum in Central California. And each of the books in the series has a title taken from a quilt pattern. Um, well, um, of course, naturally I'm blanking. Mariner's Compass is one of them. Uh, you know, uh, various things. And there's always something to do with quilting and crafts uh, in them, but the books are really about uh, Benny Harper and her relationship with the man who becomes her second husband, and the crafts are, are there as kind of a framework, but it's about the characters and the relationships and what happens among them, and that's what really sells these books, and yes, you can put recipes and, and crochet, hush, and crocheting tips and things uh, in them, and you know, and I had to put recipes in my trailer park books, no, stop it. My, my biggest male cat is the biggest baby. He wants attention constantly. Sorry, that's Toby. Uh, but, you know, as I said, that, that, this gives some, some kind of color and context to these books. But the books really aren't about that, which is, I think, is what some reader, I mean, some writers and critics don't understand. You know, it's not really all about crocheting. It's not. It's about the relationships in the book. And that's what sells readers and brings them back. Uh, and that's the virtue of writing a series. Um, you know, back in Victorian times, Charles Dickens published a lot of his novels as serials and magazines. You know, people would be waiting outside the publisher's office at five in the morning for when the next issue came out of Household Words because they wanted to find out what happened to the characters in Dickens' books. Like Little Nell, was she going to live or was she going to die? You know, that, you know, that's kind of how serial fiction really, you know, got a big start. And, you know, think about the people who are devoted to soap operas. As outrageous as the plots in those are, people, you know, care about the characters. They want to see, is Erica going to get married for the 13th time or 15th or whatever? I mean, you know, that, that's pretty wild. But, um, you know, people want to see what's happening. You know, standalones are a very different thing. You don't really write standalone cozies because people, for cozy, I mean, they want to be in for the long haul. If they like your characters, they want to see what's happening in book 17, hopefully, if it lasts that long. You know, they want to, they want to follow these characters through their lives and their careers and stuff. So you have to give, you know, your characters room to grow and uh, change and everything. And... I try to write each book so that if a person, a person comes into the series at book uh, you know, seven, they're not totally lost, you know, because the story itself is a standalone. There may be some relationship dynamics, which might be, you know, a little unusual uh, without having read the early ones, but, you know, the main story is there to figure out, you know. But readers of series love to read from the beginning and they will always try to read from the beginning if they can. They'll try to find that first book and read all the way through. Uh, but like I said, they, they are there for the, for the characters. Now, 
they also want a good plot. You know, they want uh, stories that entertain them. And my model for plotting is, uh, is Agatha Christie. You know, I am nowhere near as good as she is at slipping in those little things that will distract your attention. So, and so she pulls your attention away from the, the real clue. But I do try, and I try to give those clues as they go throughout, because um, I really want to give a good puzzle, because I like a good puzzle. I figure if the book I'm reading is too easy to figure out, then, you know, the, the author has slipped. But sometimes, you know, people who are really very fair about giving the clues, I mean, you can't help but you kind of give things away. But I, but I do try to come up with a good plot and, um, you know, put in the clues and everything like Christy would do. Um, other uh, uh, influences, I would say, are probably some of the romantic suspense writers like Barbara Michaels, Elizabeth Peters, you know, with the humor and the use of houses, old houses and things like that. And, and setting is important. Uh, if you use a real place, you have to be very careful because if you put a gas station on the wrong corner of an intersection, you'll hear about it, believe me. You know, people, you know, that's, uh, I mean, the people know that, that, who know these places, they're always happy to, to tell you that, oh no, you got that wrong. There's only three lights in the window of that store, not four, you know, things like that. And especially if you use guns, you better know what you're talking about because some gun person will let you know immediately that you've gotten something wrong. And, and things like that. So that's why I fictionalized uh, my setting. You know, I, I use the atmosphere of, the, of a college town and everything. And I use a few things that I know about Ole Miss and uh, everything, but it's, it's my invention. And, and I can put things where I want them and nobody can argue with me otherwise. And hopefully I don't forget where I put things. Uh, I mean, I should have started out making maps and writing things down, but I just have to go back and you know, look in previous books if I didn't. Uh, and that's another thing. Um, but, but setting, you know, can be important. Uh, people love reading about New York and, you know, big towns and stuff, but they also like reading about small towns and small communities. Because most of us, even if we live in a big city, we live in a community of some kind. And, you know, that's something you can explore. Uh, with cozies, I mean, you don't have them walking down the mean streets at three in the morning you know, in the center of downtown where things are scary. You know, it's, it's about, it's more suburban or small town. Uh, and you can have scary things happen. You know, in one of the books, I had somebody try to set fire to Charlie's house, for example. You know, uh, somebody, uh, you know, making a direct attack on him to try to discourage him from uh, investigating. But, you know, that's about as, as scary as it gets. Um, and it's one other thing I wanted to say about setting, but it'll come back to me. Uh, okay, where was I going? <laughs> I have my notes, but I left. Let's see. Okay, we're saying fine. Okay. Oh, well, you know, and you can have um, arcs, you know, that carry through. Like I said, um, Charlie, he's a widower of about two years standing when the, the first book opens. And he and his wife were very devoted to each other. She died of pancreatic cancer. Uh, and he's back in his hometown where he grew up and went to high school and college. And you know, he has friends there that he's known. And there is a woman in town that he's known most of his life. Her name is Helen Louise Brady and she owns a French bistro on the square in the little town. Uh, and you know, they went to school together, they went to college together and then she went off to law school and he got married, moved to Texas, and went to library school and lived there. And, but Helen Louise, after a while, got tired of being a lawyer, so she went to Paris and went to uh, school to become a French chef. But she's come back and opened a, a French little French bistro. And they, you know, begin to see each other and things move along and, and what have you. So, you know, you can add that kind of element. One of the cliches you see in the books with the women characters is that there's always a, a handsome uh, cop, you know, that, that the main character gets interested in. And truly, some of them are very, very attractive men, you know. Uh, and that, you know, that's 
it's been used so often, it really is a cliche. So if you do that, I mean, you need to, to think about it. With Erlene Fowler's series, that's what she did. She had her character come into uh, uh, conflict with uh, a homicide detective who's very strong-willed and Benny's very strong-willed and their relationship and how they work things out between them with Benny getting involved over the course of the series in these murders. I mean, they get into some really, you know, knock down, uh, what is it, knock down, drag out uh, kind of arguments in the series. I mean, it's a very, you know, tempestuous relationship, but it's real. You know, she doesn't back away from the real aspects of a couple you know, arguing over these things in the books as, you know, I mean, because you, you can imagine in real life, if your spouse was always running off to get involved in a murder, you'd be a little concerned, even if you weren't a cop, you know, so you can, you can push the envelope in some of these books with, I think that real motion, emotion and the real emotional texture like Earlene does. And I think, you know, I try to put that emotional texture in my books with the dynamics among the characters, you know, for example, Charlie, before his son moved, comes to Athena to live, Charlie had had a kind of difficult relationship with his son. Something went wrong between them. And that gets worked out in that book. And, you know, there are other things that you can do with these characters and their lives as the, as the books go along. And you can find out things about characters that you didn't know to begin with. Um, uh, one thing that um, I know people are always curious about is the writing process. And if you talk to 100 writers, you'll get 100 different answers because nobody really writes the same. And you shouldn't expect to make yourself a carbon copy of another writer. Excuse me, just because that person is successful because it's not gonna work for you. I have a very dear friend who's a very good writer, but the way she writes would drive me crazy. She doesn't write you know, from chapter one to two to three to four to five, she might write chapter one, then she might write chapter seven and then chapter 30 and then back because she thinks in scenes, you know, and she sees a lot more of her plot to begin with than I do of mine. So she can do that. But I'm a, you know, it's probably my historical training that I am a very linear person and I have to write, you know, chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven even though I may know something that's coming in chapter seven when I'm writing chapter two, occasionally, not often, but sometimes, um, I have to write to it. I might make a, jot down a few notes about it that I have to work my way to it. And Joan and I had a, a pre-meeting a pre meeting on uh, Thursday, we we're talking about this and discovered that we are both what are we people call pantsers, uh, or as some like to call it, organic writers to make it sound a little more highfalutin, organic, rather than people who outline. I mean, I, I had to learn, I went to school in the age when you had to learn how to outline. You know, you had to have a, a no Roman numeral one and then an A and a little I and a little B and all that kind of stuff. And I learned it well enough to, you know, to make an A, but uh, I hate it. You know, uh, I mean, I do have to come up with a synopsis to give to the publisher but it's very brief. It's usually not more than 500 words at the most. It's not very detailed. Uh, and it's, you know, it can change. It's not set in stone. Uh, but I come up with a general concept for the book. Like uh, the book that I just turned in, the one that comes out in August is called What the Cat Dragged In. And in this book, I have Charlie inheriting a house that belonged to his grandfather, which he thought had gone out of the family. He thought his grandfather had left it to someone else or sold it. Uh, but no, it, it's his. And it's an old farmhouse. Charlie's grandfather was a farmer. And Charlie and Diesel go uh, one day to look at the house. And Charlie hasn't seen it since he was about six years old. That's when his uh, grandfather died. And he and Diesel are going through the house. And they go up into the attic. And, you know, cats are nosy. So Charlie's looking around, Diesel goes off by himself and then Charlie hears this thunk, thunk, thunk. And he goes to find Diesel and he finds Diesel has found a human skull, okay? Not necessarily what you wanna find in your grandfather's attic, right? So that was my premise for the book. Charlie inherits his house and he finds a, a skull and actually there's a whole, pretty much a whole skeleton here. 
in an old cabinet in the attic. So what, you know, did his grandfather kill somebody and hide the body? I mean, what's going on here? Or did it, was the person who got the house after his grandfather died, who, who was guilty? Who did this? You know, who is this person? And that was, you know, that was the beginning of the story. And then I had to, uh, I didn't, re when I came up with this, I had no clue who this body was or how old it was. I mean, was this somebody from a Native American burial, you know, that he had dug up and, you know, put in the attic as a souvenir? I mean, was it, you know, a family member that got killed? And so then I had to kind of explore. And I set those questions up for myself because it's, for me, it's a good way for me to explore what is the story going to be. And I, you know, I will come up with characters who I think need to be in the story and I will come up with their names and a basic description of them and jot those down. But that's as far as I go. I start writing because I want to find the story. You know, I don't really want to know the whole story when I start. And that doesn't mean doing it the other way is not valid. I mean, I know people who write really great books who do that. They know pretty much the whole story. Excuse me, but I don't. I like to discover the story as I write. And uh, I'm a firm believer in the power of the subconscious. That your subconscious will work for you. And as you write and as you explore the story and the characters, your um, subconscious will sometimes prompt you. When you think you are you know, stuck and don't have a clue what's going to happen, your subconscious will say, oh, what if the doorbell rings right here? Who's going to be on the other side of that door? And what do they want from your main character? You know, or who does that skeleton belong to up there? And I came up, I think, with some pretty interesting possibilities in this book. And I was telling Joan the other day when we were talking, um, I wasn't sure how the book was going to end. You know, how what the confrontation with the murderer was going to go or, or what have you. But I just wrote, and when I got there, I'm thinking, all of a sudden, what am I going to do? And then I realized I had set up something which I had never even thought of early on in the book. And yeah, I think it worked for one of my, I think one of my favorite endings I've ever come up with of what to do with the bad guy. You know, it just, it was just there. And so I think your subconscious, if you will let it and if you will listen to it, it can guide you. And I think sometimes it does that with, without us realizing, you know, what's going. So in a lot of times, about halfway through the book, I will, um, I will sit down and start to think, okay, what else needs to happen based on what I've set up so far? And then sometimes I will take, you know, index cards and write plot points on them. And I used to have a, a cork board up in my office, which I need to find and put up. But, uh, and I would put them up there and I could look up there and see, okay, this is my roadmap, you know? But if I wanna take a detour over here, I can do that because I've got a structure to look forward to. But I've done that so much now, I don't really do it as much anymore because I can kind of mentally do it instead of having to see it visually. I'm, I'm kind of a visual person. I kind of like to see things sometimes figure things out but I've done this so much I mean this was my I think my 31st novel it doesn't get any easier I mean if anybody ever tells you oh by the time of the fifth one you're gonna you can do this blind and half asleep don't believe them you don't want to read their books <laughs> you know it never gets any easier I remember um, years ago I used to do interviews with writers for um, mystery scene magazine and I had some standard questions I would ask them. And one of them I would always ask is, what's hardest for you, the beginning, the middle, or the end? And I got some very interesting answers. And one of them that I remember so clearly is, was from Laurie King, who is an amazing writer. She writes uh, the Mary Russell Sherlock Holmes books, and they are brilliant. I'm not a big Sherlock Holmes fan, but this is a twist on the Holmes legend that's really fascinating because uh, it's mostly about Mary Russell, who is a, is a really superb character. But Laurie, I mean, has won the Edgar. She's won uh, you know, the British Crime Writers Award. I mean, she's highly lauded, loved by critics. And she said, there's a point in every book, usually past the middle that I get to, that I'm thinking, okay, everything I've done before this is a fluke. You know, my success up until this point was a fluke. I have now written 
utter garbage and I don't know what to do with it. You know, what's going to happen? You know, I, and it, the same thing is with me. It's like by the time I finish a book and turn it into thing, my editor is going to call and say, Dean, I'm so sorry, but you cannot publish this. It just doesn't work. <laughs> you know, because, and I think if you, if you don't feel that way sometimes, maybe you should, you know, because it makes you conscious of, okay, what do I need to do to make this better? So, you know, don't feel alone if you doubt yourself. Okay, that's the message I want to tell you. But you just keep going, you know, and write the book and turn it in and let your editor you know, tell you and listen to, you know, if you have an editor, if you have a critique group with people whose opinions you value, really listen to them. And I, my editor at Berkeley, Michelle Baggett is really wonderful. She, I've been with her. Oh, I think since 2009, her boss was my editor before that. And then she turned me over to Michelle and Michelle reads my book. She knows my character. She understands the dynamics. You know, she understands the way I write and she will tell me, okay, I think the pacing is off here. I think we need to, you know, cut some of this out to make it move. And she'll think, you know, do you really think Charlie would do this or, you know, whatever. And then there's a line editor who finds when I've changed the, you know, somebody's eye color or the timeline is wrong or, you know, I've, I think I've covered three days. It's really four, you know, that kind of thing. I lose track of how many days sometimes. Um, and, and they're there, you know, for that, but I trust them because I know they have my best interests at heart. And if you have a critique group or a, a writing partner or somebody, then listen to them. And, you know, your mother may love everything you do, and she may think you're the best writer since uh, William Shakespeare, but she may not be the best judge, you know. Uh, get people's opinions that matter to you and people who really understand what you're doing. I was in a critique group with a woman who was only interested in writing thrillers. And she was writing one and it was not really very good. And uh, we kept trying to help her because the rest of the group, most of us were fairly cozy oriented, but we also read, you know, thrillers and all kinds of books. We had more Catholic taste than she did. That's all she read was thrillers. And some of the advice she gave us you know, about writing cozies. Well, you need to ramp up the suspense here and you need to do this and you need to do that. It's like, I'm not writing Mary Higgins Clark here. You know, I'm writing, you know, Jessica Fletcher. There's a different dynamic, you know, and you need to understand the differences among these different types of mysteries if you're writing mysteries. Same thing with science fiction. Hardcore science fiction is not the same thing as a paranormal mystery with werewolves and vampires. You, know, you, need, you need to know the difference and you need to know what works in these different genres. So, she would not listen to us, you know, and she would keep making the same mistakes over and over. And the dialogue would be just, you know, you don't go in, if you're writing a thriller with a fast pace, you don't have these long sentences with multiple, you know, subordinate clauses and this kind of stuff. You know, look at Dick Francis. Look at that. I mean, he is probably the best thriller writer I can think of. I mean, the man was brilliant. Read him, read his dialogue, you know. Read Robert B. Parker. If you can stomach Susan enough, I can't. <laughs> Susan needed to die. But, um, you know, the guys like that, I mean, they know what they're doing with dialogue and pace and everything, you know. If you're gonna read these books, then you need to learn from them. And that means, brings me to probably my biggest point of all. If you're going, if you wanna be a writer, you've got to be a reader first. You know, you have to read the good stuff and the bad stuff, and you have to be able to tell the difference. You know, uh, if you can't tell the difference between Michael Connelly and James Patterson, then we have a problem. I mean, all kudos to James Patterson. He is the best marketer in the world, you know, but I cannot read it. You know, he's too violent for me and too choppy and, and what have you. You know, I like a little more sophistication like Michael Connolly or, you know, people like that. I love Ruth Rendell, uh, British writers, P.D. James, you know, a, really a variety of people. I'm fairly eclectic, you know, but you have to read and read what really engages you. Like if you're a science fiction reader uh, and love it, then that's what you need to be writing. You don't need to be writing, 
you know, Westerns, unless you also happen to love Westerns, you know. Circling back to my very first point, write what really engages you. Because if you're not interested in what you're writing, why do you think a reader would be? Right? You know, and that's why, you know, some best selling writers sometimes get accused of phoning it in. And oh, she's not really writing those books anymore. Somebody's writing them for her. You know, and that's, that's a different uh, peril of success for some people. I mean, I, I, at a mystery conference once, I, had, I walked from an event uh, from one place to another with the woman who was Robert B. Parker's editor at the time. And she told me, I asked her, I said, you know, we've heard that he refuses to be edited. And she says, yes, that's right. He turns it in and that's it. You know, and I'm sorry, that's a mistake. There is nobody who is that good who can't listen to good advice. And you can tell that, I think, with Parker's later books. I mean, he was an amazing writer, and there are several of his books I love. They're amazing. But you can also see where he kind of let himself, where he indulged himself. And that's the worst thing a writer can get into, indulging yourself and you know, putting things in just because they, they may not have a whole lot to do with the plot. I mean, like The Alienist. How many of you read The Alienist by Caleb Carr? Okay, not many. It was a great book in many ways. It became a huge bestseller. They did a movie and everything. But there was so much detail about things that really didn't matter in that book. Like the history of Delmonico's in New York City. You know, it's set in, in late Victorian New York about a serial killer. It's a great story. You know, but I really don't need to know about the founding of Delmonico's to, to get to the plot of this. And this is something that P.D. James suffered from. Um, a little bit at one point in her career, where you, she gives you exhaustive descriptions of the furniture in a house. And yes, I see the point of why she's doing this, but we don't need that much. Same thing with Elizabeth George, whose early books were really well-written, very tautly plotted. She got self-indulgent and now the books are twice as long as they need to be. You know? And sometimes you know, these people are bringing in big money for the publishers and the publishers are, don't want to annoy them so they let them get away with this same thing with Chris Cornwell you know his books got worse and worse and worse because she refused to listen to anybody uh, as you can see I'm kind of highly opinionated about some of these people <laughs> but um, again be passionate passionately interested in what you want to write think of it as what of yourself as the reader too is the reader going to be engaged in this um, and you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing because you want to write what you really want to write, uh, what, what speaks to you, whether it's, you know, literary fiction, uh, political essays, uh, poetry, which I'm terrible at, you know, I, I can't write poetry at all. Um, you know, whatever, you know, moves you, I mean, you, you really want to write what speaks to you, but at the same time, are you writing just for yourself? If you want other people to read you, you do kind of have to keep in mind, okay, who's my potential market for this? If I want to sell this and make a little money from it, who's going to be my market? And so you kind of need to know what is enough like mine that I can go and look and see what's selling. You know, if I want to write a police procedural set in a big town in in uh, the US, who, well, who am I gonna look at? You're gonna look at Michael Conley, who is probably the best-selling police procedural writer in the country. You're gonna look at Robert Crace if you want to write about a male private eye. Mary Higgins Clark was the queen of romantic suspense and she was very good at what she did, you know? Um, and that's the thing, you kind of, you look and see who's doing something similar. And you, you may write something in the same vein but you have something unique that you're going to bring to that. You know, uh, you may write about a police detective in Los Angeles, but your police detective is not going to be Harry Bosch. It's going to be your creation. You're going to put your sensibilities, your background in that. And you can come up with really quirky characters. Like right now, I'm really stuck on Dana Rayborn's uh, series about a Victorian adventurous named Veronica Speedwell. Uh, Veronica is one of those Victorian female trailblazers 
that history tries to tell you didn't exist, that they really were there. And Victoria, uh, Veronica is quite a character. Uh, and there are all kinds of quirks and things to her character, which I know are not part of Deanna's character because I know the author. But you can invest enough of yourself in these people to make them relatable and whatever, but then you give them other characteristics that make them distinctive and believable. You have to make them believable. I mean, if your you know, character has this thing for stuffed animals, then they, it has to play into the story somehow. Uh, in Deanna's books, the hero is a very tortured soul, but he has a weakness for sweets. So he's always buying, you know, Victorian uh, candy and munching on it because he's got an, a, a, an insatiable sweet tooth. And those little things can give you kind of some insight into that character and to make them not so monolithic, not just always tough or always, you know, screaming. Um, and the same thing in, you know, look at movies sometimes and see how uh, actors and actresses give you those little extra touches in their characters. Like Meryl Streep, for example, there's always nuances with her that give you insights into that character. How many of you, uh, did any of you see the movie she did as Florence Foster Jenkins? Uh, Florence Foster Jenkins was an opera, a well, very rich woman who thought she was a really gifted opera singer. And she spent her money having concerts and stuff, and she was painfully bad. You can, you can find YouTube videos of, of her singing, and it's bad. But Meryl Streep, who can sing, of course, you played her, and you know, just this description I gave you sounds kind of laughable. This rich woman who spent all her money, you know, self you know, in self-deception. But Meryl Streep is so good. She found the nuances in the character to make her believable, relatable, and you didn't want to laugh at her. You felt for her. And why was she so self-deceived? So you can take cues sometimes from actors and actresses, I think, the really gifted ones. Uh, I love old movies. I love watching Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn, and Irene Dunn, and uh, you know all those great actors and from 30s and 40s and watching them sometimes and seeing what they do and seeing how they add, you know, nuance to their characters. You know, it's the little thing sometimes, but that's something you can do. You know, Charlie is very much a family man and that's what, you know, and his relationship with the cat, because in the first book you realize the cat is really the only emotional relationship Charlie seems to have in the first book. Because his kids are away, you know, his wife is gone. You know, he has a friend uh, at the college that he's known since childhood, Melba, and that he's good friends with. But it's the cat that he has his emotional connection to. And I think, and that stays. But as the series goes on, Charlie begins to realize, okay, there are other people out there. He reestablishes his a little relationship with his son. His daughter comes, you know, so forth and so on. So those small things can grow. And again, those. Some of those things are from the subconscious. I didn't really plan it that way, but that's what happened. You know, over the, over the action of the second book where Charlie's son shows up and says, dad, can I stay with you while I quit my job? You know, the subtext of that book became Charlie's reestablishing his relationship with his son and figuring out what went wrong between them, you know? And Joan picked up on something which I hadn't even considered in uh, that book she was holding up, uh, well, no, a previous book in which Charlie, somebody leaves five kittens on Charlie's doorstep and asks him to take care of them. And uh, the abandonment issue. And as it turned out, there turned out to be another abandonment issue in the book, which I really, I really didn't think of consciously, but maybe my mind subconsciously came up with and it dovetailed into the plot. So, okay. Um, I, th I have rambled considerably. Uh, again, you know, not, not being one of those people to outline. I do have a little outline here, which I'm looking at, but uh, I tend to ramble and, and go on. But uh, as I told Joan, I'm kind of like a wind up toy. You know, you set me up and let me go and I will talk. But uh, I'm you're hoping- You're doing fine. Uh, Dean, you're doing oh. fine. You've still got more than enough time. I'm writing down some of the questions that are coming in. So okay. just, just keep going. I know you wanted to talk about 
publishing the publishing end of it too. right the publishing end um uh, well if you want to publish traditionally i mean these days it's really hard to publish that way without an, an agent uh my friend gene and i sold our first nonfiction book without one but that was because i had a connection through the bookstore one of the publisher sales reps who came by i happened to start talking to him one day about this reference book we wanted to write he thought it was cool and he took it to their national sales conference and pitched it to the woman who uh bought it eventually she was head of the paperback publishing program uh, uh, at the time and uh her name was Natalie Rosenstein. She's since retired, but Natalie bought it. But we, on the on the strength of that, we were able to get an agent for the next book, and uh, and that person is still my agent. Uh, that was in 1994, I think, and she's been my agent now for 27 years almost. So, uh, and I was lucky. I mean, I had those connections. Uh, and it, previously, before all this came about in the past year or so. Uh, you could go to writers' conferences and you could, you know, meet an agent there uh, or something and get a referral. But it's it's going to be different from now on. But uh, for to go that route, you pretty much need uh, you you're going to need an agent. And I'm very happy with my agent because I don't have to worry about some of the nitty gritty. If I'm running late on a manuscript, I don't have to, you know either email or uh, call my editor and say, look, Michelle, I'm sorry. You know, uh, so I do it indirectly. I let my agent know when she, she's the one who contacts Michelle and they go back and forth. And that, you know, that leaves my relationship with my editor just about the writing and not about the business. And that, that's been very, you know, very helpful to me. And my agent gets 15%, which I'm very happy for her to get. Uh, because she does a lot of stuff. Her agency, uh, and a lot of agents now are publishing as well. They'll take your out-of-print backlist and put it, Toby. They'll, um, they put all my out-of-print uh, backlist books uh, up as eBooks. So they're all available again. And I get, you know, itsy bitsy bits of uh, uh, royalties from those on a regular basis, you know. So, uh, they, um, and from the business side, um, I mean, worked in a bookstore. A lot of people don't understand, that. and this is from the point of view of an independent bookstore, you know, not of a mega chain or a, a website. Um, uh, bookstores get about a forty to forty-four uh, percent discount from the publisher, uh, you know, on mass market paperbacks. It's about forty-five for a trade side paperback, and sometimes it's forty-five to fifty percent on a hardback. You know, and so out of that margin, had, that's how they pay all their expenses. They pay the light bill and they buy bookmarks and bags and they pay salaries and, you know, they pay the air conditioning and, you know, that kind of stuff. All, that all has to come out of that percentage. Uh, the issue that we began to run into when people started coming in with self-published books and things was that, um, you know, we couldn't get them uh, from a distributor or whatever. They wanted to deal with us directly. And we would say, well, in order to do this, we need at least this much, uh, you know, uh, well, if, for example, if, if they came in and their book was sold for $15 and we needed to collect at least 30% of that, you know, preferably 40, you know, to keep our overhead. And that, that could sometimes be difficult because if, you know, if they're coming in expecting to sell their book for $15 and for us to fork over 15, you know, plus, we have to pay the tax on that sale. That's not going to happen. Bookstores can't give away their labor and their other things, you know, for nothing. So the bookstores have to be able to get that percentage. Um, people who were finding small presses to publish them uh, ran into trouble because the small press would only want to sell them their books at a 20% discount. Uh, and they wouldn't, and some small presses won't, don't want to deal with the bookstore, you know. Uh, they'd rather go through Ingram or Baker and Taylor and stuff. And I mean, there's all kinds of nuances to this and complications. But when you do, if you are self-published, you're published by small press, you know, talk to the, the bookstore and try to understand what their side is. And you can tell them your side, um, you know, what, you know, what it costs you and, and so forth and so on. 
to understand the economics on both sides and it will make for a happier relationship. And uh, the bookstore, uh, I haven't worked there in six and a half years now since I moved back to Mississippi. Um, you know, and they do, they do events with people with, you know, who are self-published and also uh, small presses and stuff, but, you know, they work out the economics so that it's fair to both sides, you know, and that's what you want. And the advantage of working with a store like that is if you make a good impression on the people at the store, they're more likely to sell your book than the book by somebody who comes in and is, is annoying or from somebody they've never met, you know. And when you, you, when you go in, you have to be your, your best PR person you can be. You know, you don't come in and you slap down the book and say, this is published by Amazon, will you carry it? I mean, that's the red flag to an independent bookseller, I have to say, you know. And if you think about it, you can understand why the independent booksellers are not fond of Amazon. Because Amazon gets much deeper discounts from the publishers and, and stuff. And it's much easier for them to do business. Uh, they don't have to pay the same kind of wages. There's a reason that Jeff Bezos is worth $200 billion or whatever insane amount it is. But uh, as you can see, I'm very much an advocate for an independent bookstore. The other thing is, I mean, if you meet them and you, know, you make a good impression, uh, they're more likely to hand sell your book. And that's the thing. I mean, there were people who would come in the store who were so obnoxious. And it's not just you know, people who are self-published or indie published, people from major publishers. I could tell you some stories who were so God awful that, I mean, I would not you know, sell their book for toilet paper. You know, they were so obnoxious. <laughs> You know, so if you're representing yourself, you really need to put your best self out there, you know. And if someone says, you know, we don't have a market for that. I mean, we have people coming in with all kinds of books. No, I'm sorry, we can't sell your book on flower arranging for churches. We're, we sell mysteries. Well, it's a mystery to some people how to do this. Well, yeah, it may be, but it's not a mystery, you know, so know what the bookstore does if you're going, you're going to approach them. And many of them, they love local writers. They love supporting their local writers. But, you know, work with them and, and find out, um, you know, find out the economics, what works for them, and see how you can make it work for both of you, you know. Because um, we've, we, you know, we've had events with wonderful local writers over the years, many of them. Uh, there was one woman though who was local who you know, would get up and go, she would stand right by the front door. And the minute somebody would walk in, she would grab them and say, come here, let me tell you about my book. Well, I'm a, I'm a native Southerner. That's not how we behave, you know? That's not good manners, you know? And, you know, she, I think she sold maybe two copies of her book that way by people who were too embarrassed to tell her, hey lady, get back off. Uh, you know, they went ahead and bought the book just to get rid of her. You know, that's not the approach to, <laughs> to do. Uh, and I've seen other people do that. You know, desperation is not a way to sell books. Be friendly, approachable. And I have been to signings, you know, I've, been, I've had events where nobody showed up, you know, and I have signed at a couple of mystery conventions. One time I was signing between uh, Tony Hillerman and Mary Higgins Clark. You wanna talk about a soul killing event. You know, I had maybe one person come up to me to sign their program. And both Tony and Mary Higgins Clark had lines out the, the door. <laughs> that puts things in perspective for you. You know, you can't expect, unless you have, you know, 17 cousins who each have five children who all come to buy a book. I mean, you're not going to, you know, you may not sell a lot of books unless you really know, or unless everybody in your high school class lives there and will come. None of my high school class may seem to be interested in my books, except for maybe two. So, you know, and that's the other thing. You, you kind of have to have realistic expectations. You know, it's wonderful that you have finished this book and it's published. And I applaud you. And I think that's wonderful. But getting other people to get interested is, is tough. You know, they're really interested, you know, they will turn out like you wouldn't believe, you know, for the big names. But, you know, 
for me, not so much. The only place I get a decent turnout when I go is Murder by the Book in Houston because I worked there for 30 years and I know a lot of people and I always get a good turnout. If I go anywhere else, you know, I'm lucky if I get three people, maybe some mail orders, you know, but it's okay. I've gone and I had met that bookstore uh, owner and personnel and they know me now. And I, I think I'm reasonably polite and, you know, uh, whatever. And uh, I always buy something from them, you know, uh, which can be expensive if you go to many bookstores. <laughs> but, um, you know, you want to establish relationships with the booksellers is what I'm trying to say. You know, I have never been on a tour paid for by my publisher. And I doubt I ever will be, especially not these days. The dynamics have changed completely. You know, it's not going to happen anymore. But one of my friends who um, highly regarded writer, Jan Burke, who won an Edgar for her book, Bones, which is really wonderful. Um, very smart woman, very pragmatic, very lots of common sense. She said, when you go out, your first book tour is not about selling books. It's about meeting the booksellers and establishing that relationship and letting them get to know you. you know? So that's the other side, especially triply, you know, triply, you know, 10 times more important if you are publishing yourself or if you are uh, with a small press, you know, because you're not going to have a big budget from uh, advertising. I get a small advertising budget. They, you know, my ads for my books show up in a couple of mystery publications and they do stuff on the web now, which is great. It helps get the word out there, you know, but, you know, nobody's going to spend a huge amount of money to publicize my books. So, uh, you know, my presence doing things like this and my presence on Facebook and so forth. You know, those are tools, you know, and, you know, if you're on Facebook and if you're in a group, don't, don't post something every single day about your book. Because that annoys the hell out of people. It annoys the hell out of me and I will block you, <laughs> you know, because too much, you know, you need, you need to be subtle, you know, and you need to be, if you're going to join the group, you need to participate in the group besides just posting ads for yourself. They're more likely to pay attention to you if you are active in the discussion. Yeah, that's one way to use uh, social media. And I don't, I don't post a lot in some of these groups. I just post, you know, stuff about me and my cats and various things. And people tell me they appreciate that because they get tired of the hard sell. You know, and, uh, and you know, people get turned off by that. I mean, think about some of the obnoxious TV commercials you see over and over again. We have a, uh, an injury lawyer here named Richard Swartz, who is very wealthy. One call, that's all. That's his slogan. You know, and, you know, I'm sure he and his firm, you know, do wonderful work. They get a lot of money for people who need it. But, oh, my God, you know, I will not call him. I will find someone else. <laughs> You know, you just get so damn tired. And I'm so tired of Joe Namath and his Medicaid commercials, Medicare commercials. You know, you just, you get too much of it. And that's the thing. You have to think of yourself in those terms too. Am I becoming the Richard Swartz of, you know, mystery or science fiction or poetry? You know, you want to put your best word forward. I mean, some of this, I guess, comes from my Southern upbringing. And you don't put yourself forward. You know, you behave well. You have good manners. Little old ladies always loved me when I was growing up because I was a well-mannered child. And they would often forget I was there and then they would start gossiping. I heard all kinds of stories which mostly went over my head when I was a kid, you know. But I think it's one reason why I can do older lady characters well because I grew up with them. You know, my great aunts and, and the ladies in the community and stuff, but um, just as a sideline, but you know, be nice out there, be circumspect. Uh, don't be afraid to say, oh, you know, in my book, you know, if, if there's something that relates to your book, don't be afraid to mention, oh, in my book or my poem is about this or whatever. You bring it up in context, but you've all known those people who you tell them something and then two sentences later, they've switched it to something about them. You know, I have a very good friend who's like that. And he's actually in the other room right now. I have a friend staying with me. <laughs> You know, you know, we can start out talking about something to do with me and in three sentences later, it's something about, you know, don't be that person, you know. Uh, and these are things I've learned over the years, you know, uh, being, you know, in the public eye 
as a, you know, selling myself, but also as somebody selling other people's books, you know. Good behavior is never out of place. You know, kindness is never out of place. Uh, and I can tell you, um, like I said, we have seen at the bookstore, we saw a few people show their backsides like you wouldn't believe. In front of, some of it was behind the scenes to us because when they would get out in front of the public, they would be, oh, nice, nice, nice. But they treated us like crap behind the scenes. And there was one author in particular who was just obnoxious to everybody. People who had just paid $28 plus tax for his latest hardcover. You know, somebody in the audience raised their hand and asked a question and the author looked back and said, that's stupid, I'm not gonna answer that. Would you buy that person's book again? I mean, it got so bad that the publicists were begging bookstores to have him for events because everybody complained about how awful he was. So, and he's a huge bestseller. So, uh, anyway, okay. I, I think that's probably <laughs> enough on that side of it. Just remember, be nice, be contextual, be appropriate, but do, do engage. I mean, social media is a good way to get your name out there. You know, and find the groups that uh, are germane to what you write and what your interests are. And you can, you can find a platform that way. A lot of people still do blogs. I was a member of a couple of different blogs for a while. I didn't find that that was getting me much attention. Uh, now I'm part of a group called Cozy Share a Palooza, Cozy Mystery Share a Palooza on Facebook. There are 10 of us. And every, every, every other Monday, I post something, and the other nine share it. And so we, uh, you know, we do that. But I know other blogs, like the Jungle Red Writers, um, that's a very, uh, it's a women's mystery group, very popular. They get a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of readers. Word Wenches, which is a group of uh, historical romance writers, they get a lot of interaction. So, you know, it can work. It just didn't work for me. Um, for me, I think, you know, Facebook and somewhat Twitter, but not as much, uh, Facebook does work for me and gets my name out there. Uh, my character, uh, I have three pages. I have my own page where I do a lot of promotion as appropriate. Then I have Miranda James has a page and then Diesel, the cat from the series has a page. You know, and I will occasionally post things from Diesel's point of view, you know, but I don't spend a lot of time. There. I could probably do more with that. Uh, and honestly, Diesel is the, the, the most popular character in the books. People love that cat, you know, and I can't tell you how many people I had write to me and say, you know, I, because of you, I've got a main coon now, which I think is wonderful. I'm, they are wonderful cats. And uh, I have a friend who has three of them, all purebred. And she is my main coon technical advisor for the series. I will run things by her, you know, in one book I had Diesel do something which I thought was, you know, kind of dog-like. And I asked Terry, I said, Terry, would, would one of your cats do this? And she said, oh gosh, yes. She said, they can be very dog-like, you know, so, and they're very smart and they're very loving and they're very loyal. And Diesel is particularly sensitive to people who are emotionally disturbed or, you know, just upset, you know, so that comes in useful. Um, so, Anyway, I forgot where I was going with that, but anyway, uh, it's more than time for questions, I think, so. Um, one thing you were saying, Dean, is that I think people buy books because of the relationship with the author. I mean, you know, when you, when you meet an author, or when you kind of see them on Facebook, you can tell a little bit about them. And then of course, you know, you read the book and then you're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, for me, I agree. I love Charlie and yeah. Diesel. I mean, they're yeah. Yeah. a dynamic duel, and you yeah. know, and that's what got me hooked. And they were real people. And oh, I was going to say one thing: you don't shy away from themes. Like in one of them, I think uh, one of, it was Charlie's daughter, or daughter-in-law. Well, I can't remember which one had postpartum depression, and it was yeah, really his daughter-in-law. Yeah. yeah, really yeah. bad. And you took that whole um, arc out and i was i was pleased to see that because a lot of people don't talk about postpartum depression right right yeah and you know in books like this you can talk about real issues mm -hmm. you don't want to beat people over the head with it and in fact the book that uh where the 
diesel finds a skeleton. I had a background issue I was going to talk about uh, in that book, but we decided that it was too heavy. It was too, it would, add, it over, it would, you know, it just was too heavy for the book. And I wrote it and then my editor read it, my agent read, you know, read that. And they said, you know, we're really concerned about this. I mean, for one thing, to explore the full ramifications of that issue, I would need to write a longer book and a different kind of book. Uh, I was using part of my own personal history uh, for that. And it's like, well, no, this is not my working out of that issue for myself. I don't need to impose that on the readers. So I changed it into something else and it works just fine. But, you know, there are, are, are some, you, you can talk about some things. I mean, I get flack sometimes because there are, you know, gay characters in my books. I'm gay, you know, although I write about a straight uh, man. Uh, but there are gay characters in the books. And that comes into play a couple of times uh, in some of the plots about things. And there's prejudice. But, you know, I'm not trying to, to teach anybody anything. These are just people. I mean, they're just real people. And that's what you write about. And you know, the more real you can make them, uh, you know, the better. And yes, there are homophobic people who get really turned off and it's like, well, you know, that's your issue, it's not mine, you know. Uh, in fact, there was one woman said that uh, one of my friends reported her for hate speech on Facebook. Wow. <laughs> and I just blocked her, you know, so I'm not listening to this. And for mostly what I see on Facebook, there's, you know, I don't see much of this, you know, because, and people, there are a couple of the minor characters that there's one gay couple in the series that people just love. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you never know, but don't shy away from writing about real people. We all need, uh, I mean, this has become more apparent in the last few months. We need visibility of all groups, you know, and I took a little flack uh, because of the housekeeper, Azalea, uh, from one woman who was telling me how racist her speech was, and she was writing a book about you know, said during slavery and her characters didn't speak in a, in a, a, a racist, uh, I'm trying to think of a stereotypical, you know, manner. And it's like, well, honey, I grew up here. I know women like this. I work with them right now. I know what they sound like. Not everybody has a college education and not everybody, stand, you know, has subject verb agreement, you know, in their speech. I mean, you listen to Southern white people I mean, my own mother, her grammar was terrible. She had a third grade education, you know. These people exist, you know, but Azalea is a strong, intelligent, vibrant woman. And, you know, she may not sound like she's got a PhD in English literature, but she sounds like a woman who's worked as a domestic all her life. Her daughter is educated, professional, and she sounds like she would sound, you know. And Azalea is loved and respected by everybody in these books. You know, she is not a figure of fun, you know. But yeah, I mean, she represents, very well too. <laughs> you know, she represents a lot of women like her who still exist. You know, I could write, I could have made her Hispanic, same thing, you know. But, you know, it's our chance to represent. One of the things for me, you know, growing up, um, you know, I saw almost no gay men in books, or if I did, they were horrible stereotypes, you know? And everything I read was very white, except for some racially stereotypes. Like the old Nancy Drew books are full of racial stereotypes, you know, which are very painful to read now. But now we have the opportunity to represent. And I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna try to appropriate somebody else's culture and say, this is what, you know, a young black man today would sound like or do, you know, I'm not going to write from that point of view, you know, but we need to represent these characters. We need to bring in all the community if we can, if it's appropriate to the story. You know, I don't have any token characters in my books. You know, they have a reason for being there. And so, you know, that's the thing. But to go back to what you said uh, that started this was, was the author. Uh, I mean, I can think of any number of authors that I met at the bookstore whose books I had not read or authors I met at a mystery conference I had never read, but they were so charming and they were so interesting on their panels that I said, I'm going to read that person's book, you know. So every time you're in public, that's your opportunity, you know, to establish that connection and get them interested, 
you know, because if someone keeps my, my friend who's staying with me at the moment was fussing at me because I'm wearing a t-shirt to this. And he said, you can only make one first impression, right? And I said, yes, you can't, but you know, writers are writers. They're not going to be focused on whether I'm wearing a t-shirt or a tie and you know, button down collar. You know, they're not here to criticize what I'm wearing. You know, they want to hear me talk. That's what they're going to criticize. <laughs> so, but anyway, enough of that. More questions. A um, couple things. Well, one person asked, and maybe you can, um, you can send me an email later if you want to, but someone wanted the list of writers that influenced you because you, or they can rewatch this because this is being recorded. But okay, I'll, yeah, but I'll, I'll send you a list, yeah. Okay, that'd be great. And then we can, we can do that. Um, word count average per book. Well, my, my kind of, for this kind of book, you want about 72 to 75,000 know, for a cozy mystery. Uh, you know, for what they call a bigger book, like a thriller, you're looking at 100,000, 100 to 120. Epic fantasy is probably 150,000 or more. I think they just meant for your cozies, and that's what yeah, I was But 70, 72 to 75. Because I was looking at the page count in this one, and it's 280 pages, so yeah. Yeah, it comes down to that. I mean, you figure, uh, I, I write in with Courier font, 12 point Courier new font, and that comes out to about 250 words a page. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and believe me, as I'm writing, I constantly <laughs> keep a track of the word count to know where I am. Uh, and uh, I've, I've learned, I mean, I don't know how, I guess I've absorbed it over the years that you know, it almost always comes out to about 75,000 words. Mm -hmm. you know, one time I came up with, I think 71, and my editor said, no, it's gotta be a little bit longer. So we found a section where I could explain something better and add some some content then you know but pretty much you learn to you know there's a some kind of word counter in your brain or something that knows what you're doing you know but also i think if you read enough of whatever the type of thing you're writing you get to understand um the development you know the you know we need a we need a a, a plot point here and a plot point here and then we need a major plot point here and then a major reveal and so forth and so on until you get to the point where you know okay this is the big one this is where we reveal all and then there's maybe a chapter afterwards where you kind of slow down and pull everything together for the reader and that kind of thing so but you can absorb this structure just by reading you know like read Agatha Christie if you want to write a cozy mystery I mean nobody's better at structure than she is and her her short stories are superb I find short stories extremely hard to write because of the compression, you know, especially mystery stories, because you've got to have a plot, you know, in about 20 pages, you know, and I've written some short stories that I'm very proud of, but, you know, they were extremely hard to write. You do have the one short at the end of one of the books. I can't remember which one. Oh, at Charlie the end of Arsenic and Making Old Books. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to say, Charlie met, a little bonus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, well, that one was the very first one to go into hardcover. So we wanted to give something a little bit extra to encourage people to buy the hardback and, and not wait for the paperback. <laughs> so that's fine. Yeah. And I thought about uh, doing a couple of other short stories about different things you to offer, you know, for free on the net. But well, in one of them, the fifth book, The Silence of the Library, I wrote about one of my enthusiasms, uh, the children's mystery books. Mm hmm. And I created a, a fictional writer and series, uh, a character named Veronica Thane, who's very much in, in, uh, based on Nancy Drew. And there are excerpts from one of the books peppered throughout the book. And I had really intended to write that whole book and post it on my website. But um, I'm not always good about keeping track of time and how much time I've got to do this, that, and the other. And at that point, I had started to write two books a year. Plus, I work full time. Uh, still as a librarian and I spend I mean I'm the head of technical services um, at my job and we've I've lost the staff person so I, I now I'm having to do about three different jobs you know and I spend my life at a computer screen all day long and uh, and I there's only so much time I can put myself to the computer when I get you know when I'm off work so I just I can't write that much so I've had to let that 
go by the wayside. Although I know I've pissed off a lot of people who really wanted to read it. I wanted to read it too. I wanted to write it. It was fun because I was very much mimicking the language and the, the, the kind of florid style in those books from the 30s, you know, and I may get back to it yet, but on that mythical day that I retired, I can actually have a little more time. So. Um, someone asked, is it possible to buy the whole cat series together or do you have to buy one at a time? Uh, yeah, they only sell them uh, one at a time. I mean, I think, you know, they sometimes they may offer a package deal for the eBooks. I don't know, honestly. I just don't keep track of those things. Mm -hmm. Another question, how long does it take you to write your books? And at this point uh, in your life, does your writing support you? Um, I'll be honest, I do make more from the writing than I do for my day job, but it's not enough. Uh, I mean, and frankly, I'm, I'll be 62 in June and I have some you know, health issues. It's more about the insurance, you know? Uh, I could get by, I think, um, kind of, sort of, you know, on the writing income, but it's the, it's the health care and the insurance, I don't, you know, that I'm worried about. And I just you know, have to keep it. Um, about how long it takes me to write a book. Well, the fastest I've written a book was in six weeks. But that was one, that was one of the trailer park books. And that was one, the only time that I had ever had a book kind of crystallize from almost from beginning to end. You know, I got, I got into it and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, this is happening. This, I mean, and I had done that thing with the, in the index cards and I put up, you know, the, the plot points on the board and it was bam, 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 bam. You know, that book just flowed, you know, and I, my subconscious or something knew where it was going. And I re still am very fond of that book. I think it's one of my, one of my best plots, but uh, that's a book called Best Served Cold, uh, written by Jimmy Ruth Evans. And uh, I'm really fond of that, of that particular book. But that one, that one crystallized so easily. And I, I wrote it very fast. You know, I really didn't have to stop thinking about it. Um, I don't really write much at all during the week because of the full, the daytime job. I, I tend to write on the weekends because I'm a little more relaxed and rested and, and stuff. But when I get into, after I've gotten into a book, uh, and here's where the subconscious comes in, I, you know, I've, I've been thinking about it during the week and little things occur to me and I'll jot things down so that by the time I get to the weekend, I can write, you know, like 40 pages in a weekend sometimes. Drove one of my friends crazy, the one who, you know, writes chapter one and then chapter seven and whatever. <laughs> she did, it drove her crazy that I could do this. But I think, you know, it's what, you know, you have, we have other obligations, most of us. We can't just sit and write all day. So you have to make that work with, you know, your life. People have children. I have four cats that have to be fed. I have litter boxes to be cleaned, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, you have to make that work. Um, you know, the, the book I just turned in took me over a year because of, you know, COVID, the election, various things. I just, I, my brain was in a fog. You know, I just found it very difficult to concentrate and focus. And also partly because of that issue that I was gonna write about that I ended up changing. I think I was so intimidated by that. And that should have been a clue <laughs> right there that I didn't, need to, I didn't need to tackle that in this book. But I just, I couldn't get my mind to focus on that book and kind of figure, okay, what am I doing here? But then it got desperate. You know, I really had to get this book finished by a certain time if they weren't going to, because they had pushed the, the publication date back twice. It's like, okay, I'm not, I can't, do, I can't do this again. You know, they've been very nice to me, but I can't do this again. So that forced me really to focus. But by then, you know, things were happening. We were getting vaccinations and whatever. And I ended up finishing that book in about three weeks. You know, desperation. <laughs> Sometimes desperation will drive creativity, I can tell you, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and I was one of those kids in high school that everybody hated because I would finish things early and turn them in. No longer. Doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> you know, you get the worst thing I can have is, okay, okay, I've got a deadline and it's, it's seven months from now. Okay, well, I can, I can take a month off. I can do this. Uh, no. 
you know. Uh, and my friends in my critique group used to laugh because they could always tell when I was getting close to a, you know, a deadline because the pages would start coming out faster and faster. <laughs> I do not recommend working this way, but uh, you know, it, it really does, for me, it, it really focuses the brain to work sometimes because I'm fundamentally extremely lazy. You know? and, uh, and you know, I love, there's many things I love about writing but actually doing it is not one of them, you know? <laughs> except when it goes really, really well. Like when I wrote that one book I told you about that I did in six weeks, that was amazing. You know, I couldn't wait to get to the computer because the story was just there, you know? And I think if I were more disciplined, I would find the story would be there more easily most of the time because I do think creativity is kind of like a muscle. You know, it's like the treadmill. The, all your clothes are hanging on. You know, if you take them off and you actually get on the thing and you walk so much a day, you do get results, you know. But if you get on there and you do a mile and, you know, put it clothes back on it and then three weeks later you do another mile, you know, that's not going to get you anywhere, you know. Uh, but if you, you do try to be disciplined and you don't have, I mean, I'm not one of those people who thinks you have to write every day to be a writer. That doesn't work you know, for some of us, it just doesn't work for our schedules. You write, you, you need to focus and uh, do something regular, you know, but you know, you, you, you can't write every day. There are things that come up, real life intervenes, you know, but write as much as you can when you can. And when you're doing it, try to focus on that. And that's what, that's what I do. You know, I, I've given up on trying to shut the cats out of my office. So I just have to let them come in and out. Fortunately, they don't insist on trying to type for me. Uh, none of them do that. Although one of them loves to get in my lap for attention. But, you know, at least they don't step on the key. I have some friends whose cats get up on the keyboard and just sit there. Mine don't do that, thank God. Yeah, but uh, write as much as you can when you can. And, you mentioned a critique group, sorry. Um, and I belong to a critique group and my, I give them two chapters every two weeks and that keeps me writing sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? So are you, do you, so when you write, do, does anyone get it before your editor or does it go to a critique group first or? Uh, no, I mean, I had to, um, one of the things I've missed most about, you know, having moved from Houston back to Mississippi is I, my critique group. And we tried in the beginning uh, to do it online but that was before zoom and we were just trying to do skype and stuff and half the time i couldn't hear them and it just it was very frustrating plus these days i mean they wouldn't start meeting until seven and we'd meet from seven to nine and these days i'm in bed by seven because <laughs> i get up really early you know, to get ready for work and everything i'm not one of those people who can just bounce out of bed and yeah i'm gonna get in the shower and i'm gonna go to work i have to have at least two hours and two cups of coffee to wake up and to even begin to think about getting in the shower, you know? So uh, I, I, I may be like a mid morning person or mid afternoon person, but that's it. You know, so I, you know, I, it just didn't work for me anymore. And I haven't found a group here, you know? Um, I, I have two friends who often read the, the manuscript when I've, they're beta readers when I, when I first finish it, um, they will give me feedback, but pretty much it goes, you know, to my editor. What about editing? Someone asked, how much editing do you do to your work before submission? Um, well, I mean, to be honest, I only do one real draft because I tinker as I go along, you know, and I will, I will kind of look back because um, for me, sometimes it'll be a week between writing sessions. And so I'll go back and look and say, where was I? What was I doing? And then I will, I will see the words that I have thought I typed correctly, but didn't. I love putting ing in places where it doesn't belong. You know, that muscle memory thing. You know, I can't, I, I find it hard to type the verb be without making it being, you know, and imagine is usually imaging and things like that. You just, your muscle memory when you type a lot, you know, you come in. So I catch those things and I go on. And then I will see, oh, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't really make the point I thought it made. So I will tinker. And then I go on and write, you know, more. And then I do that as I move along. And then at some point I'll think, oh, you know, I should change that because 
you know, I don't like that character's name, so I'm going to change it to this. And so, you know, you go back through and whatever. So by the time I, I finish the book, you know, I've gone through it, you know, in various ways, you know, several times. So, um, you know, but then my, my editor reads it uh, and gives me great comments. I mean, she actually reads the book because some publishers these days, the big ones, you know, they don't have a whole lot of time to read everything as thoroughly, but she reads it thoroughly and I get extensive notes it's all electronic now it's no longer little yellow stickies on the print um and so i go through that and i respond to that and then uh, a line editor goes through like i said and checks things you know for logic sequence and making sure characters names are spelled correctly all the way through and you know looks at time frames and oh here you said this but what you said on this page contradicts that so which is it because I'm, I'm kind of bad about that sometimes, you know, because I, you know, you get so involved in the story, you know, you don't always remember the minutiae, you know, and unfortunately with my twisted way of working, I really don't have a lot of time to go back and I don't have time to let the book sit for two weeks and then read it again before I submit it. I have to turn it in. And I'm, I'm kind of lazy that way because I know my editor is going to tell me what's wrong and what needs to be fixed. And I'm lucky that way, so. But it is a second set of eyes. I mean, it sounds like you have two and three sets of eyes really that are looking at it. Well, in a way, yeah. But the other thing, so you have to remember, I've been doing this a long time and uh, they they know I can finish a book, you know, and they know that they can, it can be fixed. If I turn in something that, you know, doesn't make my editor happy, then it can be fixed. We can work on it and fix it, you know. So that's where I'm at an advantage, uh, at an advantage of someone who's just starting out, who's only published a book or two, you know. And that's the thing, you have to kind of build a reputation of someone who can finish a book. And I have gotten less disciplined. I see somebody has got a cute cat. Oh, look at that beautiful baby. I have two tuxedos. <laughs> uh, so anyway, but you know, that's the point. But to go back to that earlier question, how long does it take? You know, I've, um, I have about nine months between books now, and I don't always use the whole nine months. So, you know, I, this book is, the next book is uh, due uh, August 15th, and I haven't started it yet. <laughs> but I also have this thing is, I don't, I really don't like to start a book unless I know what the title's going to be. And, you know, I can come up with titles and suggest them, but, you know, the, the, marketing people and the editorial board has to approve the title you know so uh but we finally have a title for the next book and so now i can start writing it. i mean i know the basic concept for it and um the uh you know who the character is going to be and everything but now that i have a title you know it's it, it becomes real to me it doesn't it's not real to me until i have a title and the title for the next one you're the first people to hear this outside my agent, my editor, is Hiss Me Deadly. Cool. Because <laughs> they always want something to do, you know, with the cat, play on the cat, or, oh, there's another beautiful baby. Um, either play on the publishing, I mean, on the book angle, the library angle, or the cat angle. So that's why. And the covers, the covers are, are they painted? Someone paints the covers? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, somebody in the art department. And yes, for those of you who may have seen them, I know that's not a main thing. <laughs> Uh, I've complained about that from the beginning. Oh, looky there. Carla has a beautiful baby too. Is that a tortie? Yeah. Um, I sent them pictures of Maine Coons, but the cats on my books are not as fluffy as they need to be. They've tried to make them more fluffy as time goes on, but they're not fluffy enough. These little gained weight, yes, in the pictures. Yeah. Um, well, these are weighs 35 pounds, so. Yeah. Let's see. Carla says- I tell people- Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to read some of the stuff on here, but um, okay. Carla says, thank you for teaching me more about how to develop a relationship with booksellers and readers. I also love hearing about all the different characters in your books. I don't usually read cozies, but I'll check out Charlie and Diesel for sure. Well, thank Charlie, you, Carla. I appreciate Charlie, that. Charlie, you won't be disappointed, I will tell you. Um, which, oh, which book was about the postpartum depression theme? Um, gosh, I was trying to remember. Carla, I have the book, so I'll look through it if he... Um, you know, that's the problem if you've written a number of these is you don't always remember exactly what happened to which one. <laughs> um, you just had the baby and. 
Yeah. Was it know. was it six cats a slaying? You know what? I think it was. But it was yeah. the one. The Christmas one. That was yeah. my favorite one out of all of them. Do you yeah. have a favorite out of all of them? Uh, well, it's hard, uh, you know, because, um, you, you know, it's like, which, which is your favorite child? You know, you don't want the other children to find out about it. <laughs> I have a particular fondness for that book for, because it was a holiday themed and I wanted to do that. But, but also because of um, the relationships in that book, the, the five abandoned kittens and, and things. Uh, and uh, that's one where I came up with the title before I had any idea about what the story was going to be. Because I, you know, they specifically wanted me to do a holiday themed when I was going to do you know, Christmas. And I thought of six cats a sleigh in. And that's why Charlie finds five kittens on the doorstep. <laughs> you know, and then I went from there. But I have a, a particular fondness for that one. But I also, uh, Careless Whiskers. I had great fun with the plot of that one and some of the minor characters. And it's got some, I think, really fun twists in it. And I got to pay tribute to a writer who, whose book, books I really like, Michael Dahl, uh, and his characters in that book. So, you yeah. know, there, there are little in jokes I put in them sometimes that mean nothing to anybody except me. You know, so, or unless you're an old movie buff, The Powerful Truth, if you're an old movie buff, you might have picked up on that one. That was a takeoff on the Cary Grant Irene Dunn movie, The, I, the Awful Truth. <laughs> so. Well, I think it's an author's prerogative. I mean, I've put little things in mind that only the person reading it might see something. I mean, a certain person, if they read it, right. they'll be like, oh my gosh, I know what that's all about, but not everybody's going to know. Right. Yeah, I throw in names of you know people I know. and I mean, I've named um, buildings on campus of the little college after two of my favorite professors from undergraduate you know, degree. And, you know, and I, I, I threw in... Um, uh, the name of a sales rep I worked with in, in uh, Texas. Uh, in one of the books, uh, 12 Angry Librarians, there's a, a, an academic librarian conference in town. And uh, I have, her name is Carol Seiler, and I, I named the sales rep in the book after her. But I didn't tell her. And I knew she read my books. And then one day out of the blue, I get this excited message from Facebook, Dean, you put me in a book, <laughs> you know. And I just get a kick out of doing that. And people, you know, people get a kick out of that. You know, and uh, it's, it's just fun sometimes throwing those names in there. Yeah, so. Any other questions? <clears throat> Let's see. Julie says, I also learned a lot from your sharing, Dean, and Diesel makes me want a Maine Coon too. <laughs> I know, I, I really want one, and, but mine are all rescues and, you know, they come when they come. You know, I, I had an older pair and then I don't know if any of you have read Carolyn Haynes, uh, the, the uh, Delta Girls, uh, Delta, Daddy's Girls, excuse me, Daddy's Girls, but they're set in the Mississippi Delta. And Carolyn is a big animal advocate and, and she's like my big sister. And we went to visit her uh, several years ago at Thanksgiving. And she said, um, could you do me a favor? There's a, a, a friend in North Mississippi. I found a dog for her. And she'll meet you in Jackson, which I live in the Jackson area. She said, would you mind taking the dog back with you to Jackson? She'll meet you there and pick her up. And I said, well, sure. I mean, I'm happy to have a little dog to find a home. And Carolyn says, well, we have to go pick her up at the vets. This was at Thanksgiving. And she said, oh, and while you're there, they also, uh, somebody dumped six kittens on them. And she said, I know you have two cats. She said, but you can at least look at them, okay? I said, okay, I'll look at them. And uh, we get there and there are these two tiny little kittens. They're both tuxedos. And we go in and the, the vet, veterinarian opens the little cage and one of them immediately climbs out and wants to be in my hands, in my arms. And I'm thinking, oh hell, <laughs> I don't need two more cats. <laughs> and Carol said, well, you only have to take one. I said, look at them. You know, they're obviously bonded. I can't take one and leave the other one. So I brought them home and they're Bert and Ernie, you know, they're about three and a half now. And they're so funny, and, you know, Bert is timid and shy as easily. And Ernie is the smallest of my four cats, but he's got the biggest personality. You know, he's afraid of nothing. So but anyway, um, I'm not sure why I got there, but uh, 
anyway, they're, they're, you know, and I, I pick up on things for Ramses to do. Uh, that's the other cat who comes in later in the series. I pick up on things for him to do from based on my menagerie, you know, so I, I don't even remember the beginning of the question. <laughs> I think it was the, uh, she said she wanted a Maine Coon. Yeah, I like how yeah. the cat would crawl up Charlie's leg because we've all had cats do that. Just, yeah. Yes. <laughs> they find their way with those little claws up your pant leg, so. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think, let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, Janet just says, sorry, I see Dean is great. Love his personality and all the great information. Oh, you made another- Thank you. Thanks. Janet is our, um, writers of current secretary so oh well thank you so, um anyway dean thank you so much um i will send you an email afterwards as a reminder about the list and uh, okay kind of a sure. follow-up after today yeah. thank you so much for taking the time speaking to everybody just being you you know well thank you i mean it's a pleasure for me i mean i used to do this you know more often uh and but you know opportunities have not been there for a while that uh, this makes it more possible. And I appreciate you all taking your time to, to listen to me ramble on. So I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Anyway, thanks, Dean. Have a wonderful day. Right, with your thumbs day. up thank and you. Julie applauding. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here. And we will see you again next month. Take care.